Friends, welcome to chapel to this Monday, Thursday service. On Tuesday, we gathered in the quad, many of us, to walk the stations of the cross. We remember Jesus' journey to the cross, and we also remember the God who was with us in experiences of suffering and oppression. And since that time we've walked the cross, we have heard more news of death. We have heard of gun violence in a subway station. We have heard of the death of another black person killed by police in Grand Rapids, Patrick Loya. And perhaps there are stories that each of you carry from families and friends that you know, that you, news that you've received this week. And so we continue to keep watch. We continue to remain with one another, to pray, to mourn, to rage. We also gather today to perform radical acts of care for one another. One of the, the reasons we gather on a Monday, Thursday is to remember the Jesus who cared for his disciples and allowed himself to be cared for on his journey to the cross. His most radical acts of care were also some of the most ordinary, washing and feeding. And so we do those ordinary radical acts together today, washing and feeding. I'm glad that each of you is here on this day. Before um, we move into the service, I also want to remind us of services next week. So we'll gather for Earth Day and Easter services next week. On Tuesday, we'll be here in Harrington Chapel. Um, Dr. Brown will leave, lead us in a service called Rising with All Creation in Memory of the Extinct and in Hope for the Endangered, where we remember the deaths and lives of all creatures together. And then on Wednesday, instead of our regular noonday prayer, we'll gather in the garden at 5.30 p.m. for a labor as liturgy service led by SAGE. On Thursday, the Office of Institutional Advancement and Columbia Friendship Circle, one of our donor groups, are gathering for a service here, and everyone is welcome to that service as well. Some of our students will be leading. That's on Thursday at 10, 10 a.m. And then on Friday, again, we'll be in the garden for a service of word and table with Sage leading and our Creation Care Award winner, Kathy Tesson, preaching. So invite you to come to all of those Easter and Earth Day services next week. To those of you who are joining on live stream, a reminder, if that you, a reminder to gather food elements if you want to participate in communion online. Or, and to gather water if you want to wash or simply touch the water as a reminder of your baptism. There will also be a blessing offered for all of us who choose not to participate in the meal or the foot washing. Also a reminder that we, uh, this service is being live streamed and while the focus is on worship leaders, any of us might be in the live stream. A reminder that we are all called to lead one another in worship and to be worship leaders together. We do not have chapel tomorrow, but there are resources on the Office of Worship Life YouTube pa page for contemplation. So if you are looking for resources for Good Friday, um, let us know. We're happy to provide you with those resources. And now, let us worship God together. Actually, and now I'm going to pray for us. <laughs> O Holy Trinity, your dance of love invites us into the mysteries of death and life, pain and hope, joy and despair. Giver of life, bearer of pain, our comforter, we thank you for creating the waters of the earth, the fruits of the earth, and for feeding us each day our daily bread. Show yourself through our sharing of these gifts today. Dance among us, Holy Trinity, that we may join our earthly dance with yours. Amen. Let us rise in body and or spirit. <clears throat> peace
Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor, but you do not always have me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Gospel of John. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. You will never wash my feet. Unless I wash your feet, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. One who has been does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean, and you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table. He said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very true, I tell you. Servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but it is to fulfill the scripture the one who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I tell you this now, 
before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Very truly, I tell you, whoever receives one whom I, I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Holy God, we need your good news. We need the challenge of your Holy Spirit. We need this time of word and worship and connection. Help us to tune our hearts and minds to your will and to your way as we approach your scriptures today. Amen. So I preached these two texts almost a decade ago to the day. Uh, it was 2012. I was a senior at Columbia, and I was asked to share a short reflection on these scriptures at a Maundy Thur Thursday service at my church. Now I know it is popular to dunk on your form younger self, but I searched my files and I found my little homily, and it was good, y'all. <laughs> it was good. As my nieces would say, it was giving. It was biblical, biblically sound, theologically sound, with flourishes of pastoral care and a few obligatory pop culture references and some personal stories. Dr. Anna Carter Florence would have been proud. <laughs> and I read it thinking, 2012 Zena had it together. She must not have been as distracted by her cell phone. She must have given herself ample time to write and reflect. And she had a real sermon writing process, apparently. <laughs> These are not the same things that I can say about 2022, Zena. So I was a little tempted to just recycle it and keep it moving. But 10 years of living since that last reflection have given me a new lens to look at foot washing. And I couldn't ignore it. One that's not quite as uplifting or polished, but one that actually choked me up when I read John 13 again. Ten years ago, I started working as a hospice chaplain. When I learned of my acceptance to a hospice CPE residency, like any good student, I asked my professors for a reading list. Unfortunately, we did not have Dr. McGarr Sharp's death, dying, and bereavement class at that time. But I spent the summer of 2012 reading everything that I could about death and dying, what dying people want, final gifts, how we die, gone from my sight. And I felt like I was equipped to give people what they needed. I knew all the words. But on my first day, working on a hospice inpatient unit, I learned that nobody wanted my words. It was humbling after a seminary career spent excelling in words, reading and writing and speaking. But all dying people wanted from me was my presence, my listening, and my touch. They didn't care about my newfound wisdom about cross-cultural variability and death approaches and attitudes, my understandings of terminal agitation or nearing death awareness, none of that. Nope, they just wanted me to sit and listen and hold their hands. Most of the time, patients didn't even remember my name, as revealed when one patient told a colleague, go get that Rudy Huxtable looking girl to come in here and sit with me. A reference that spoke to my 80s baby heart and there was one time that a patient asked me to sing, but as he drifted off to sleep, aided by a healthy dose of narcotics, he tapped me and said, will you turn off the radio when you leave, honey? Because that screeching is interrupting my sleep. <laughs> Spoiling, spoiler alert, the screeching was me. So that was not in my toolbox. I did not sing after that. Hospice is about comfort care, and clearly I do not have a comforting singing voice. But I remained amazed at how much of my ministry of comfort was touch. I brushed hair, I moistened parched lips with mouth swabs, I lotioned dry feet, I held hands, and I hugged a lot. I remember once hearing someone say that if you ask for someone if they need a hug and they accept, 
don't be the first one to pull away. And I made that a part of my ministry and I was often stunned by how long those hugs lasted. I started to seek out more information about therapeutic touch and healing touch and light massage and, and really touch became one of the most used tools in my ministry toolbox. So these 10 years have helped me see something new in these texts. Reading John 13 now, verse one jumped out. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. From sitting at deathbeds, this rang so true. We love until the end. And on the eve of most expected deaths, Unlike Hollywood, depictions would have us believe. There are typically no dissertations, no huge declarations, no deathbed confessions, no big revelations, just presence and touch. This ritual of foot washing makes so much sense to me in that context, an anchor of caring, vulnerable, loving touch to help us feel comforted when all else is falling apart. We talk a lot about skin-to-skin -skin contact for newborn babies as they come into the world, but touch plays such an important role when we leave the world as well. Touch so often transcends all of our language. I'd always seen this text through the lens of Jesus teaching his disciples, of Jesus demonstrating hospitality or modeling new and radical modes and social norms. But my study of this text this time led me to wonder how much of this ritual was for Jesus? How much of this was Jesus' comfort care at the end of his life? On the heels of his anointing at Bethany, another place where it's easy to miss the ministry of touch and presence for the more dramatic elements in the story, this seems like another place where Jesus is highlighting touch. In Jesus' ministry, he touched to heal when he didn't have to. There are so many instances of Jesus touching those who were deemed untouchable or being touched by them. And this is a glimpse into Jesus' humanity, a reminder that loving touch is a human need. In the past decade, I've learned so much about touch deprivation from people who have been isolated for this type of connection and intimacy for so long and hunger for just a gentle hand to rest on their shoulder. Touch can comfort and anchor in a way that words cannot. And so many of us don't feel anchored or comforted right now. And I think it's not a coincidence that it comes after a time where we have it. Hugged a lot, shook hands, held hands while praying, and even been together in person consistently. The pandemic conditioned us to see everyone within six feet as a threat to our health. And while we know why that was necessary, it has certainly thrown us off balance in ways that we cannot even articulate. On the eve of Jesus' death, there didn't need to be a lot of stories and parables and instructions and conversations. There needed to be a ritual of touch and connection with people he loved. And I see that as something we need now. And of course, touch can be fraught. With too many of us having been on the receiving end of unwanted or violent or traumatic touch. But I've come to see that part of our work in ministry, beyond all our words, is creating a safe space for sacred touch, where we prioritize consent and care and humility where we don't shy away from touch because of our fears, but where we become trauma and healing informed in the ways that we practice touch and ritualize it. And I am so grateful in so many ways to have been and to be on the receiving end of such touch. I had a medical crisis a few years ago and what I thought would be an overnight stay in the hospital stretched into 17 days. And I have a wonderful circle of support with lots of pastors, ministers, and chaplains, an occupational hazard, of course, and who said wonderful things and prayed beautiful prayers over me while I was in Piedmont. But there is one encounter that I remember so much more than any words that anyone offered. 
Reverend Sylvia Wilson, um, she was the chaplain at Agnes Scott years ago when I was a student there, and she's now the pastor of Hillside Presbyterian. And she came to visit, and she asked, could she lay hands on me and pray and anoint me? I will always remember how loving and caring that felt for me in such a time of uncertainty and grief. Her act unlocked tears that I didn't know I was holding in. It helped me name grief that I didn't even know to name, and it helped me recognize the spiritual pain that had come tangled up with the physical pain. And it helped me get on the road to healing. There's something shattering and beautiful and necessary about our rituals of touch. And I'm grateful that we have this space today, after so long without it, to share this precious time of touch and ritual. And may we reflect on the ministry of touch in our lives. Amen. So I'm going to invite those gathering basins and towels and water now to do that and to bring them to the circle. In acts of care for and service to one another, we remember Jesus um, by remembering him in this act. So if you wish to participate in the washing, I invite you to remove your shoes and socks at this time. And if you do not remove them, that will be a sign that you are choosing to participate in a different kind of way. So we're going to start um, with, uh, at various points, I'll start here, Theo will start over there, and you'll turn to the right of you and wash someone who has bare feet next to you. And then that person, once their feet was, are washed, will turn to the next person to the right of them. So we'll go around, if you get to the end where you don't have a place to wash feet, Look around the circle and see if there's someone maybe at the beginning of the circle who needs your, their feet washed. For those of you who are choosing not to have your feet washed, be in prayer for another person around the circle um, or recall a, an act of care that you have received, a way that God has been revealed to you today. And if you're joining via live stream, again, invite you to pray with us or to use water to participate in this um, ritual with us.
going to open this um, circle up now for a time of testimony for anyone who would like to share something. Um, perhaps it's a witness to a way you have been cared for this past year or been shown care, uh, as in some of the stories that Minister Regis shared with us in her sermon. Or perhaps it's something else that has come to you this holy week that you want to share as we keep watch and pray with each other. So if so, I'll bring this handheld mic to you so that we can all hear one another. I just really appreciate the way that I've been welcomed into the Columbia community since moving here. Uh, it's been very nice to go through the educational process this semester so far with people that are going through some of the same struggles as me, and I appreciate being welcomed. Thank you. Let us then pray together before we come to the table. Friends, let us give thanks for Jesus, our mother, who labors with all who suffer, and let us remember all who are near to the heart of God. As we pray, please offer your prayers, spoken or silent, in the pauses after each set of petitions. Jesus, our brother, you knew the brutality of bondage. We remember the path that led to your execution. We pray now for those in prison, in detention, those awaiting trial or execution. Jesus, our teacher, you stay with us when we are afraid. We pray for all who carry burdens that break their spirits and crush their hopes. For all who encounter violence, death, loss, pain, the brutality of war or oppression, we pray. Jesus, our joy, you offer us hope in the shadow of death. We give thanks today for those who walk with us, who love us through loss and despair, and who call us to a faithful life. We name them. Jesus, bread of life, you feed us through your church around the world. We give thanks for the churches and all the communities that journey with us this holy week. Jesus the Christ, midwife of new creation, hope of the hopeless, shepherd of the fearful, passion of God, tree of life, beautiful Savior. We seek your face in the suffering of this world, in the creation that groans with you for something new to be birthed, in the power and persistence of your spirit, Strengthen us to watch with you in your grief 
as you remain with us in ours. In your precious name we pray. Amen. For about 20 years, I have sat behind the piano and or organ during this period in the service, and I never thought that I would get to stand behind the table to share with everyone else. And admittedly, sometimes sitting on the organ and the piano, you know, they forgot about the little guy that was playing over there and I didn't get served sometimes. So it's good to be able to come to the table. As I was reflecting and in prayer, I remembered all through grade school having to deal with segregated tables. And not necessarily in a racial sense, but if you weren't an athlete, you couldn't sit with the athlete. If you weren't a cheerleader, you couldn't sit with the cheerleaders. If you weren't considered popular, you couldn't sit at the popular kids' table. But then I remember 2,000 years ago, a table that was free of barriers and free of any type of phobias that anyone had against anyone. Jesus sat at the center of that table with 12 other individuals, and everybody was welcome at that same table every personality, every character, every type of mental instability, anything that they brought to the table, it was welcome that night. So today I am grateful for the Lord's table, the table that has been set so graciously for all of us who are here today. I'm grateful that while Jesus sat at that table, he saw the people who would be cast out, the people who might be looked over, the people who might be forgotten. And he made it clear that at his table, none of that would ever happen again. So when I remembered that in prayer, I forgot all about the times that I couldn't sit at certain tables. And I am grateful for that today. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received of the Lord that which I have also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, Jesus broke that bread. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup. And after blessing it, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. He went on to share with the disciples, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I would at this time invite those who are serving to come and join me at the table. Communion today is by intention. 
we would ask that you would receive a piece of bread from the server and dip it in the cup of juice and or wine. We do have gluten-free wipers and individual cups for those who want or need them. The server will bring all of these elements to you if you want or need to receive them in your seat. As we come to your seat, if you would prefer not to partake in the bread, the juice, or the wine, and perhaps you just want a blessing, we ask that you would cross your arms and a blessing will be given to you. If you are joining us via live stream, we invite you at this time to receive these gifts of God for the people of God. At this time, I invite you to join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I think something is trying to communicate with us <laughs> through the microphones, someone. It is 10.55, so if you have class at 11 and need to leave, I'd encourage you to do that. And if you're able to stay, I encourage you to stay and participate in one last ritual act. Um, we are going to participate now in a practice that is, is um, done in some churches called a stripping of the altar. Here we'll have a stripping of the table. This is an emptying out of the sanctuary. We will take everything that we can out of this room at this time over to the lounge other than the organ, the table, the furniture that doesn't move. 
We do this as a way of reminding ourselves that we will keep vigil in spaces that are bare, in spaces that are empty during these next two days. We do this in memory of the kinds of work that accompany grief and mourning, the bustle in the house, the mourning after death. That's what Emily Dickinson says. I think of women's work of cleaning and cooking. So in this act of cleaning this space, we remember all of those who accompany bodies and people in grief. Once we have emptied this room and taken everything out or stacked the chairs, we'll come back and we'll sing one last time. And then we will leave this room in silence. If you want to speak with each other outside these doors after the service, you can. Other than that, we will um, hold silence in this space after we take everything out. So let us now begin. Mm -hmm. 